Okay, this is the third video in our intro series on using the Bruker Dimension Icon AFM. In this one, we will engage the tip to the sample, we will capture a few scans of our sample, and then we will do some image analysis along the way. Uh, before we engage, there are two final things we need to check. Under microscope, we need to go to engage settings and look at a few of these parameters. So the first thing I look at is the sample clearance. Make sure that's 1,000 microns. Remember, we went to great lengths in the setup video to have it such that our tip is one millimeter above the sample surface, and that's what the microscope expects us to have when it engages. So this needs to be one millimeter. Uh, next, I look at the peak force engage set point. This is the amount of force that we're looking to have when the tip first engages the sample. So we have a peak force set point during the scan, and we also have a peak force set point when we engage the sample. It would be nice if we knew what the peak force set point for the scan was because we can then put it in here, but if we have an unknown sample, my recommendation is usually to start at around 40 millivolts, especially for semiconductor materials that will be a pretty good force to start with. Once you learn what a good set point is during the scan, you can put that into your engage set point for the next time that you engage. Note that if you have softer materials, we want this value to be larger, and for hard materials like our silicon, silicon oxide, nitride, 3.5 materials, usually, again, 40 millivolts is pretty good. Anything lower, and you might get a false engage where the tip thinks it makes contact, but doesn't actually. Uh, and then lastly, we look at the engage mode. So Smart Engage will use the resonant frequency of the probe in order to make a faster and gentler engage to the surface. It only takes about 12, 15 seconds, so I recommend that. Standard Engage is slower, so maybe 40, 50 seconds, and that is what you want to use if, for whatever reason, Smart Engage doesn't work for your tip and or your sample. Okay, so those all look good. I'm going to say OK. And then the last thing I'll do is tune the cantilever. So we only need to tune the cantilever to find the resonant frequency if we're using Smart Engage. We are using a Scan Assist probe, so it knows to look for a resonant frequency between 32.5 and 107.5 kilohertz. The Scan Assist probes are usually somewhere in the 70, 75 kilohertz range. So I can click Auto Tune. It'll look in that frequency range. And ideally, we just want to see a nice symmetric peak like this. This tells us that we should be able to have a good smart engage. So this all looks good. We'll exit. And now we are finally ready to engage the sample. Just check, make sure that your vertical horizontal deflection haven't drifted more than plus or minus 0.1 volts. They haven't, so we will click engage. The microscope will go through a pre-engage check, which means wiggling this cantilever by driving the piezo. Then it will adjust the focus of the objective optical microscope so that we're on the back of the cantilever. As the cantilever gets closer to the sample, the sample comes into focus. That beep means that we landed tip onto the sample, and we should land somewhere in the middle of the piezo range. So remember, 12 microns range, we're somewhere in the middle there. If this drifts close to the extended or retracted, portions, it'll turn yellow and then eventually red. So if you ever see that, you do want to click withdraw and try to figure out what might be going wrong. All right, so we've landed and we don't see any data yet. So maybe our scale is too large, 300 nanometers. If I put that at 20 nanometers, now we can see some topography as we're scanning the silicon oxide texture of the sample. Uh, but we might be between two of these boxes and we want to ultimately image one of these etched boxes. So we need to figure out how to do that. Uh, now we seem to be pretty well in line with this row, but say I wanted to image this row for some reason. I know that these boxes are 10 microns apart, so I might want to shift my cantilever down 10 microns. The convention here is that while we will move the cantilever, the value that we put in is as though we're moving the stage. So I would say 10 microns positive will move the stage 10 microns up, although again, really what you'll see happens is the cantilever moves negative 10 in the Y. So just remember that convention. So that put us about in line with this row, just to do that as an exercise. Uh, 
And we also want to take a look at our peak force curve here. Uh, now, our peak force set point is still at 20 millivolts because we're only scanning this surface texture. Uh, when we start scanning into a box, we'll start to see that change as it needs maybe a different force to accommodate the step ledge that we'll see. All right, so now we're ready to start looking for a box. Uh, I might increase the scan size, but before I do that, I might also drop the scan rate so that when I increase the scan size to maybe five microns, my tip velocity doesn't get too fast too quickly. All right, so now our 20 nanometer scale is too short, so maybe we'll go up, back up to 300 nanometers, and now we see that we've found a ledge. And we're scanning near the top here. So if I want to put this ledge in the middle of my screen, I'll click offset, and then it looks like probably we have a ledge here. So I'll click here and click execute. And so that should put this in the center of my screen. I would probably have to wait now to, to image it because we might now be back between two boxes. So this could be a good time for us to decouple the samples per line from the lines. So maybe make that 25. And this will allow us to proceed more quickly along the y-axis. As we get closer to our etched box, here we see our ledge again. And here, this is the recess that we ultimately want to image. All right, so now, again, this gives us a pretty quick view that here is our etched box. And I'm going to use my offset tool again and maybe click somewhere like here in the middle of that box and execute. It's going to continue scanning down. I can click frame reverse, which will pivot it back up in this direction. Um, but I know that these boxes are 6 microns, so 5 microns isn't enough. So maybe I'll go up to 9 microns. And my tip velocity will increase in kind. And so now I, I'm getting closer to imaging one of these uh, boxes. So again, I can offset to the middle of this box and execute. And maybe I'll reverse my frame again. Um, but really, I don't need to scan the whole view quite yet. So this could be a good time to change my aspect ratio to 10. That will lock me into a narrow band. And so I've already centered on it. So now I'll just scan back and forth across this ledge. And I'm pretty well centered, so this looks nice to me. I'm doing what's called a real-time line plane fit. If I had none here, my data will leave the screen. And if I would put, say, two microns in, I just see that it's all shifted down. A real-time offset plane fit will center the data on zero. And then, as I did before, a line plane fit will try to flatten it out. So let's go back to uh, 300 nanometers. Now, as I said before, now that we're scanning this box, our peak force set point has increased. And sometimes with oxides, nitrides, it can tend to run away on us a little bit. It seems pretty stable there. But yeah, see, it went up again. So what I, what I might do is lock my auto set point off and either leave it there or I've scanned this before at about 0.1. So I'm going to reduce the force, and that might help save uh, the lifetime of my tip. All right, so now it's bouncing back and forth because I'm only scanning two lines. So if I want my aspect ratio of 10 to be represented here, I want my lines to be 1 tenth. So I'll say 25 lines, and that should get us back to having roughly square pixels. Uh, now, nothing is being saved right now. Uh, we would see it if it were saved. It would be popping up in here. So one option to save is that we can click Capture Now, and that will just save whatever is on the screen. If we want to save the whole field of view, then what I recommend is clicking Capture Continuous, and then either Frame Up or Frame Down. So we're going to force it Frame Down, 
So it will start near the top, it'll bounce off the top, and then as soon as it bounces again off the bottom, it will automatically save that image for us. Uh, this is about a 50 second scan, so while it does that, I'll explain that we have four data channels that we're collecting. You can collect eight simultaneously. What I have here is height sensor. So height sensor is your typical topography channel that you want. Uh, and this particular one is going to save the retrace and it's gonna offline it without a plane fit. So this line plane fit is only happening um, right now in real time for our visualization, but we'll get our data unmodified and without a plane fit. This height sensor is the trace, so we're saving the trace and the retrace when you use this canine experiment. I do recommend doing that. Uh, then peak force error is really just showing us the difference between the set point and the measured quantity. So really it's showing us the perturbation in the system. And then in phase is sort of the peak force tapping mode answer to phase imaging from tapping mode. And this can kind of give you an indication of the stickiness of the sample. I'm not really sure why it's giving us this wavy band here, but if we had, say, two different materials, then one would appear in different contrast compared to the other. This is all the same material, it's just that one is recessed and one is not. So it's not really a, a useful channel for us in this case, so we're going to focus on our height sensor. All right, so we've now saved that image, and it's about to save another one because we're capturing continuous. Uh, something I'll point out is that our trace and retrace, there's a little gap there. If we wanted that to be a little bit more narrow, we can say decrease our scan rate and we should see that that will tighten up. In our case here, the standard sample, we really just want to check that it's 180 nanometers like it's supposed to be. So we don't care too much about this gap. We care more about the difference between the top and the bottom. So I would maybe go back to 0.5. Anytime you change any parameters, it will disrupt the ability to do a capture continuous. So if we wanted to capture continuous again, we would need to frame down. So these are all parameters you can keep adjusting um, and change to see how they affect your trace and your retrace. I want to show you a couple things in analysis. And while we do that, I'm going to set this back up to have a aspect ratio of one. So we'll get a full image of one of these boxes. But that would take a little too long for us today. So I'm going to drop our pixels down to 128 by 128. And I'm going to increase our scan rate to one hertz. I'm still in capture continuous, so I'll frame down. So we'll start up here. We'll get our box somewhere in the middle. Now to do some data analysis, I'm going to open up that last scan that we did, and that will open automatically in the analysis software. This is free to download and install on any PC. Uh, when we come in on it, it's going to be in what's called the 2D data channel. So this shows us some of the basics of our scan. We might want to look at our 3D model. And here, if I control click out, I can see that it's kind of not flat at the bottom. So remember, we did a line plane fit in real time, but we offlined it without a plane fit. So I think I'm going to go in to plane fit, and typically I'll do an XY first order plane fit. And if I execute, you'll see that it kind of flattened everything out. And if I go back to the 3D model, it looks flat. Something else you can do in plane fit if we undo. If for trickier samples, you might draw a box over here and a box over here and execute. It'll only look inside those boxes and try to basically flatten them out. So that would be the same as what we did, but again, used for some trickier samples. So in our lab, some of the major analyses that we often do are things like section, and we can draw a line across that and then move these cursors, one on the top, one on the bottom, and then down here we can see a vertical distance of 179.34 nanometers. So again, this should be 180, so we're really close. We have a well-calibrated scanner. I can delete that, maybe right-click and do a horizontal line, so that will give me a full horizontal line across the full field of view. And again, I can see 179. If I want to average more lines together, I can right-click for a rotating box. 
and I click in the middle and drag and I can expand it and now I get one line that is uh, representative of all the data in here. So it's averaging each of these lines into one and I'm getting, again, about 179.2 nanometers. The reason we call it rotating box is because you can shift click on a corner and you can rotate to accommodate any angle that's offset from perpendicular. Um, one other thing people will do is roughness. So if we click on roughness, it'll give us the RQ, which is equivalent to the RMS value. So it's really high because it's incorporating all of the pixels in this image. If we wanted to see the roughness just on the top ledge, we can draw a box there, and our RQ is just 0.3 nanometers. If we drew one in the bottom, we can see that the RQ there is also about 0.3 nanometers. All right, so those are some of the main ones. You can go through all of these different icons and, and see what they do for you in your sample. One other one that you can sometimes use is flatten if you have little imperfections or bad lines, you can execute a flat end, but just be really careful because of uh, what you're doing to your data. Pay attention to this note. All right, so if we go back to our software, we see that we have our image, and it looks a little strange, like we have different color here and here and here, and that's because we're doing this real-time plane fit line. Notice that the image that got saved doesn't quite look like that, and that's because there's no plane fit happening to it. So if I went to a plane fit of none in real-time, and I were to change this to, say, two microns, and I see we're offset about half a micron, so I can change my center to negative 500 nanometers, and then my scale maybe to one micron or 0.3 microns, now I see I don't have all that corrected nature to my scan. I'll go back to line and it'll look like this because we know we can go into our, our analysis software and we will be able to, to see it again. If I open that in here, then we can do, again, a plane fit. We can execute x, y. Here's a, an example where we might want to, to draw a couple boxes and execute that way and flatten out our image. And again, we can now look at our 3D model and that looks a little bit better to us, a little flatter. Note that once you have this looking the way you want it to, you can right click, change the color scale so you can modify the scale here. You can even enter whole numbers, if you wanted this to say go from 200 to negative 200, you can do something like that. Um, when you're ready to, you can export and this will save it as a TIFF. In a lot of these different places, you can say go to your 2D image, you can right click and export the screen display, but that's actually not great because it's going to give you the pixels on your screen rather than the pixels that you scanned. So if you want the pixels that you scanned, my recommendation would be to file save as and make some kind of copy of it so we can call it an edit and then in your browse files you can find our edit and then if you right click and export as a TIFF now you're exporting as an 8-bit color or 8-bit grayscale or 16-bit grayscale and that will be the exact number of pixels that you have in your image so this is something I'd recommend make some nice whole numbers on your scale or modify your color scale in any other way, and then again, do your export in this way rather than just a simple export like this. All right, now I think that's where I'll end it here. So we have a number of scans that we can play with. Uh, one other thing I guess I'll say is if this weren't quite perpendicular, we can draw and we can measure how much we're off. So this is only off by maybe a couple tenths of a degree and then you can go and plug that into the scan angle, maybe like 359.7 to accommodate 0.3 degrees offset. And that's how you can get to a more perpendicular scan, but not necessary for today. All right, and I think with that, I will withdraw. And I will leave all these other parameters for you to investigate in the SOP and to explore on your own with your own scans. We'll end our video series here and I'll say good luck to you with your 
AFM scanning. <laughs>